So the title of this class officially is Living with the Times. Um, the topic of the class is the, what's generally referred to. Now, just an introduction. I know, or as far as I know, we have people here in the class that come from a relatively wide variety of background in terms of familiarity with Torah study. Um, I prepared this class with the intention that it should be relevant and within reach of everybody regardless of the amount of background, but at the same time interesting, novel and with some new things for everybody. So I've made an effort that it should work for all of you and I hope that it will. Um, that didn't make sense, but that's okay. I made an effort to see that it should work for all of you and I hope that it will. So, okay, so it's called Living with the Times. Now, this expression, when we say Living with the Times, the title of this class comes from something that the Alter Rebbe said. The Alter Rebbe was, is called the Alter Rebbe in Yiddish means the... Is there a clock in here? Yeah, there, okay. The old Rebbe, he was the first leader of the Chabad movement. He was a spiritual grandson, a student of the student of, of the primary student of the Baal Shem Tov, who started the concept of Hasidism, the Hasidic movement. Rabbi Shneer Zaman of Liadi, as he was known, aka the Alter Rebbe, started a specific subset within Hasidic, I guess what we could call Hasidic Judaism, the Hasidic approach to Judaism, which he, which is called, referred to as Chabad. So he is what is known as the first Chabad Rebbe, the first, you may also hear the first Lubavitcher Rebbe. So he's called the Alter Rebbe, the old Rebbe. And that name is still around from the third generation of Chabad Hasidim, the Alter Rebbe. Then the next Chabad Rebbe, the next leader of the Chabad movement was his son, the Midler Rebbe, followed by his grandson, the Tzemach Tzadik. The Tzemach Tzadik was not the son of the Midler Rebbe. He was the, the grandson of the Alter Rebbe the son of the Alter Rebbe's daughter, whose name was Devorah Rebbe Tzim So at that time, they, there had been three leaders of the Chabad movement, three Rebbe's. So they were called the Alter Rebbe, the Old Rebbe, the Mittler Rebbe, the Middle Rebbe, and then the Tzemach Tzedek at the time would have been referred to as the Rebbe. So they had the Rebbe, the Mittler Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe. And those names have stuck today, even though we're several, several generations further down the line. So that's just where the name comes from, the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe had an expression that he would say, he said, in Yiddish, which means we need to live with the times. Now the question, what did that mean? What did he mean by that? He definitely didn't mean that we need to know what Donald Trump is posting on Twitter or what other people are posting on Instagram. Not only because Twitter and Instagram weren't around, just because that's not what he was talking about. So what was he talking about when he said we need to live with the times? He wasn't talking about making sure to check Bloomberg and the stock exchange and Bitcoin every day and know exactly every hour where it's up to. What he was referring to was what he meant we need to live with the times was we need to live with the Parshas Hashavua. Parshas Hashavua is a term that is used to refer to, even though it's not technically the translation, that is used to refer to the weekly Torah portion. So when we say Torah portion, at least in the context of this expression, the Torah we're referring to here specifically is referring to the five books of Moses, Chamesh Ochum Torah, Bereshis, Shmos, Vayikra, Bamibad, Varim, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that body of work, those five books, which are referred to as generically the Torah, the term Torah also can refer to a lot more, and we'll get to that. That body of work, which is divided into pr five primary books, is divided into 53, 54 portions, Torah portions, which are often referred to as parashas, even though technically speaking, parasha is not the precisely correct term. Parasha just means a paragraph, technically speaking, but it's a term that's used. So when you hear people refer to the parasha, or the weekly parasha, it's talking about the weekly Torah portions. So the Torah, the Chamesh HaChem Torah, the five books of Moses were divided into these portions, that match up with the weeks of the year. So through the course of the year, we read the entire Torah through from beginning to end, the entire five books of Moses through from beginning to end throughout the duration of the year. So we go through it every year. Now, the number of portions into which it's divided varies from year to year because you don't necessarily always have 
exactly the same, same number of weekends. And the, the way it works generally is primarily it's on Shabbos, on Shabbat, Sabbath, seventh day of the week. In Shul, in synagogue, we read that week's Torah portion from an actual Torah scroll, from a Sefer Torah. And now what happens is it gets a little complicated, a little messy, because there are times when there will be a festival, maybe Pesach, Passover, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur might be on Shabbat. And in that event, we read the holiday portion, not the weekly Torah portion. Now, if we don't read the weekly Torah portion, what happens is things are going to get thrown out of whack because there's one portion per week of the year. So the way it's arranged is there are certain portions that are kind of really one, to an extent, one large portion that's divided into two smaller portions. So in some years, we'll read it spread over two weeks. In some weeks, where some of the some of the weekends, some of the Shabbosim, the Shabbats, have been hijacked by a festival which takes over the Torah portion, then it's then there will be at some point in the year two Torah portions that are combined into one to compensate for that to make sure we get through everything. So, anyways, just just some background. So when we say when people say the term parsha, generally speaking, they're referring to the weekly Torah portion. Now, now there is there are customs that a lot of people have to study the Torah portion, not only to just read it in shul in the synagogue on the weekend and Shabbat, but to actually study it throughout the course of the week. And then when we come to the weekend, we actually are familiar with what it talks about, with the stories, with the meaning, the lessons, etc. Learning different people will learn it with different degrees of commentary to go along with it. So this is the what the term parshas hashavua, which literally means paragraph of the week, but really in English a, a, a better term would be the Torah portion of the week, because there are usually many paragraphs in each Torah portion. So this is what the parsha is, and this is what Al Rebbe was referring to. And he said we need to live with the times we need, he was saying, referring to the fact that we need to live with the weekly Torah portion. The question is why? What's so important? Okay, I'll see you. <laughs> Question's been answered. Right. So, and, but the, the question is, what does that mean specifically, right? Especially today, and I'm guilty of this to an extent because I teach online and with videos and energy is a fantastic word because it's vague and ambiguous and doesn't really mean much of anything and people love it. Um, I plead guilty. But I want to get a little more specific because you're right, but I want to get down to explain what that means, right? So exactly, so it shouldn't just be fluffy and all-encompassing and ambiguous, but we should understand specifically what it actually means and technically why it's valuable. You know, because at the end of the day, walking away with terms like energy and, and you know things like that can be very effective for getting people to walk out of the room feeling inspired. It doesn't necessarily get us to walk out of the room with something tangible that we can actually do and understand. Right? And the more tangible it is, the more value we're gonna the more real life value we're gonna walk away with at the end of the day and take out to go, take with us going forward in life. That's why I just want to, it's, that, that is the answer, but I want to get more specific about exactly how and why. So there's an expression that says in the Zohar, so just today I don't think we're actually going to get to this week's Torah portion specifically, we'll get to that tomorrow, but I, I want to just do the background, I think it's very important. So there's an expression in the Zohar that says, Kutcha brichul istakel ba'oraisa o bara alma. means Kutcha brichul, the Holy One, blessed be him, this is Aramaic, not Hebrew. It's, all, it, it's very similar. It's pretty much Hebrew. It's Aramaic that... S some words in Aramaic are more similar to the equivalent words in Hebrew than others. This is pretty close. Kutcha b'richo istakel ba'eraisa looked into the Torah u'bara alma and created the world. The question is, what does that mean? The Torah was written a couple of millennia after the world was created. So how could God have looked into the Torah and created the world? So this statement is essentially saying that the Torah is literally the blueprint based upon which the world was created. We have to understand what that means, because it doesn't seem at face value to make much sense. How could something be built on a blueprint that was written 2,000 years, odd 2,000 odd years after it was built? And the answer is, and this is going back to what I was saying before when I said that the term Torah generically in some contexts refers to the five books of Moses. In a broader sense, it can refer to the entire body of, I guess, what we would call Torah knowledge, which is there's the Tanakh, 
which is an acronym for Torah, the five books of Moses, Nevi'im, the prophets, Ksuvim, and the scriptures, which includes the prophets, which some of you may be familiar with, there's Jeremiah and Isaiah, and the list goes on, and the scriptures, which includes Psalms and some other minor prophets and things. Those three bodies of work form what we refer to as Torah Shabbich the written Torah, the written law. Then there is the oral Torah, which is, number one, the commentaries on all of those texts, and also the discussion about the practical ramifications of what it says in those texts. Because if you just read the actual written Torah and you... I mean, even to say to read a, a, a literal English translation isn't really possible. Because there are many words which can be accurately translated in a number of different ways in English or in any other language for that matter. There's no way to have an actual, literal, perfectly precise translation of the text of the written Torah into any language without including some level of commentary. Because whenever you translate from one language to another, there's always going to be some degree of level to which it's imprecise, to which there's interpretation, to which there's a choice of which of the options of translation are you going to use for a given word. But even if you were to look at, let's just call it for all intents and purposes, a precise literal translation of the text, it doesn't necessarily reflect at face value what we have, let's say, for example, what's referred to as Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, and the way that we live today entirely. It doesn't always align precisely, and that's because, first of all, a lot of the sentences in the scriptures it's hard to understand what they even mean if you don't have some degree of commentary involved. So, and then, so you have the commentaries which are what's referred to, part of the body that's referred to as Torah Sheba Al Peh, the Oral Torah, which is called the Oral Torah because it was a tradition. It was a tradition that started essentially, let's say, from Moses, from Moshe Rabbeinu. He received the Torah from God on Mount Sinai and together with commentary, with explanations, and he taught those and they were passed down. And, of course, whenever Jews discuss something, there's arguments, there's differences of opinion. And so the body of what is referred to as oral Torah progressively grew because there, was the, there were the commentaries, explanations that Moses got from God on Mount Sinai that he passed on. Then there was discussion and debate exactly what it means and what are the ramifications and the discussion grows and grows and grows and grows. Eventually, what the, the, when we refer to Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral Torah, generally speaking, I would say again from a generic perspective, the text at the top of that primarily would be the Mishnah, which is the earliest form of a code of Jewish law. Then there's the Talmud, which takes every pretty much, not every, but for the most part, every paragraph of Mishnah and discusses, debates, analyzes over the course of a number of pages. Because in Mishnah you'll have varying opinions and you'll have, you have to figure out which one are we actually going to behave in accordance with. And then after that, and, and before you can even get there, you have to figure out what are the rationales behind each one, what are the reasonings behind each one, so, which allows us to, number one, figure out what they say, what the ramifications are, etc., etc. All of this is discussed in the Talmud. And the same way the Talmud has to analyze, discuss, unpack everything in the Mishnah, there are then commentaries and layers and layers of commentaries and generations of commentaries that do the same thing to the Talmud until you get to an actual real-world code of Jewish law that we have today. So all of that, everything from beyond anything that's not written inside of Tanakh, Tonavim, Ksuvim, the five books of Moses, the prophets, and the scriptures, anything outside of those texts, which are very clearly defined, precise texts, anything outside of that is part of the tar body of Torah Shabbat Peh, of the Oral Torah. Now, all of this, written Torah, Oral Torah, all of it is part of what we refer to as Torah. Now, the question that I open this up with is, how can Zohar say that God looked into the Torah and created the world if the Torah wasn't written yet? We can have another question. It says in the Talmud that, or it says in the Torah, in the written Torah, that when Yaakov, Jacob, was heading down to Egypt, right, he had, in the last few Torah portions, have been very dramatic. We had a Broadway musical written about them. <laughs> and T Joseph and his Technicolor Dream Code, if anybody's not sure what I'm referring to. So... Part of what happened in this story is that, so 
maybe we'll talk about it in a little more detail tomorrow. I'll see how much we're going to get into it in detail. But Joseph, Yosef lands up in Egypt. He becomes the viceroy of Egypt, gathers together food in advance of a famine that he knows is going to come. When the famine hits, basically everyone's starving except for Egypt, who stored away food at his suggestion. His own family comes to Egypt to get food. At first, they didn't recognize him. They'd sold him into slavery. Long story short, they end up bringing their father, Yaakov, Jacob, down to Egypt. On the way, it says that Jacob, Yaakov, sent his son Yehuda, his son Judah, ahead of him. And the Talmud says that he sent him ahead to set up yeshivas, to set up places of Torah study in advance. So when he arrived, there would be places of Torah study ready to go. Same question. The Torah hadn't been written yet. So how did he set up places of Torah study? How were they studying something that didn't exist? So oh, okay. So, right, so we, it, it's essentially the same question that we have on what the Zohar says about the Torah being the blueprint, on what the Talmud says that when Yaakov sent Yosef ahead of him, it was to set up yeshivas. What were they studying? What blueprint did God look into when it hadn't even been written yet for millennia? It hadn't been written until millennia later. And to understand this, to understand how all of this makes sense, what we need to do is understand exactly what Torah really is. So Torah refers not only to the five books of Moses, but to the in entire body of what we could call Torah knowledge. Now, what Torah actually is, the definition of Torah is divine wisdom, God's wisdom. The texts that we have today are, I would say perhaps, and I say this with caution, but at least to an extent, the foremost, no, I, this I can say clearly, I adjusted the words in my head, the foremost expression, the foremost tangible expression that we have of divine knowledge. That's what Torah is. So divine knowledge, divine wisdom, God's wisdom was always there. And what's written in these texts is an expression of that divine knowledge, that divine wisdom. God knew what it was going to say. Now, how God can know the future and how that can be aligned with free choice is another whole kind of worms that we're not even going to have even close to time to get into. But God knew what the Torah was going to say. God's knowledge was always there. God doesn't become wiser. God doesn't get more information because he scrolls through Twitter and sees what's going on. God knows what's going on. He doesn't need to look or wait to find out. So God's knowledge, God's wisdom was always there. Since before even time and space themselves were created, it was there. The what we have today are, that we refer to primarily as Torah are various stages, various bodies, which are expressions, different layers of expressions of manifestations of that divine wisdom. But if someone was able to be in tune with the soul, the essence of Torah, which is divine wisdom, if someone was able to be in touch with that and in tune with that, they wouldn't have had necessarily to wait until we got these texts which express it to us, which are manifestations or expressions of that divine wisdom, because they were in touch with that divine wisdom itself. So they were able to, Yaakov, Yitzchak, Avram, all of them were able to study Torah, not because it had been written yet, that what we refer to as Torah which is the, what we may call for, let's say, the body of Torah wasn't available, wasn't accessible yet in the form of a text. But the soul, the essence of the Torah was always there. And anyone who was in tune, anyone who was in touch with that was able to, to study it and to connect with it and to receive from it. So understanding now that Torah isn't just these texts, these texts, and I want to just put in some fine print here. At the end of the day, as far as we are concerned, these texts and these expressions are practically speaking the most important part because that's what we have to study, we have to understand, and we have to know how we are supposed to live our lives based on what it says inside of these texts. So for us, 
practically speaking, the primary focus does have to be on the texts. But those texts are the body of the Torah. The essence of Torah is divine wisdom, and that was always there. And divine wisdom, God's knowledge, God's wisdom, is the blueprint based upon which the universe was created. So now it's making a little more sense, right? What it says in the Zohar. The blueprint for the creation of the universe was and is God's wisdom, divine knowledge. The texts that we generally primarily refer to as Torah are various instances of that divine knowledge being expressed, being manifested in the form of information that humans are able to understand. But that's not the entire extent of what Torah is. Does that make sense? That clear so far? So is like the written Torah considered secondary maybe? Or we're just not on a level to tap into the essence? Secondary to what? The essence that like the patriarchs were. Um, the, the, the answer first of all, I want to make sure there's no room for misunderstanding, is no. Um, primarily from a practical perspective, the answer is obviously no, because that's the manifestation that God chose to present to us, which means that's the thing that's most important for us to focus on and study. So it's definitely not secondary. Relative, as far as we're concerned, the body of information that's accessible to us in the form of oral Torah and written Torah and oral Torah is the primary form in which Torah exists from a practical standpoint for us. I wouldn't personally venture to vote that either or is more primary or secondary than the other. I wouldn't even want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, with a country mile pole for that matter. Um, and I don't know that it's possible to say that one is or isn't. They're both, they're both parts of Torah, they're both divine, and you know, the only one that is qualified to even have a say in answering that question, I would say, is God. And I haven't yet worked out how to catch him by DM, so we're going to have to wait. <laughs> So what is it, so when he built these temples or these places of Torah study for practical reasons, so they would get there together and they would just, I guess, meditate spiritually and connect? Because then what are they, what are they doing there? What is That's a good question. I wish I actually had a real, honest, tangible answer about what they actually did, which I don't. What I would suggest and this is speculation based on the pieces of information that we do have. Um, so I guess I could say it's almost like, you know, coming to, or forming the best possible conclusion based on the circumstantial evidence is that they were studying information, studying knowledge that they had at their disposal due to the fact that they were in touch with this body of divine wisdom, with God's wisdom. At what level exactly and what layers exactly and what elements and components specifically, I have no idea. And I wouldn't, you know, like, I don't like making things up. I mean, I love making things up, but I don't like to do it, number one, on the record. And number two, if it's, you know, taking responsibility for the truth, I don't like to take responsibility for the truth if I made it up. So I don't know. Because there's things that we, we know that they did, even prior to the beginning of the Torah, which were separated them from the Egyptians, right? the hand washing, the eating matzah. Correct. So was it maybe these things? That were Perhaps. And there was, look, there, there had been communication between man and God. I mean, from the times of Adam, certainly Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, you know, th there was also, and that's a good point, there was also a body of knowledge that they had been, or some degree of information that they had been presented with in a tangible way. What exactly the balance was, I don't know. But it's a good point. And, you know, to what extent that was the majority of it, the minority of it, again, I, I don't know. But I think it's fair to assume that would have played a significant role. So now keeping in mind exactly what Torah is, looking at Torah as... Div oh, boy. I could go for like another half hour on this, but we don't have. So... Now, I want to quickly just address another term. There's a term that, you know, people like to use today about being spiritually evolved. 
spiritual evolution. The context in which I like to use the term spiritual evolution is kind of the opposite of what people in fluffy culture tend to refer to as spiritually evolved. Um, not to put that down, I use it in that context too sometimes, but what I mean or what I want to get at here is that there's a world that we live in, that we experience, that we're in touch with, we relate to. There's God, the creator, which is who is, whether to use the pronoun which or who I don't know, it's not a person, individual, I don't know. I'll use both and hopefully I'll survive. Um, so God is infinite, both in terms of magnitude, quantitative, also qualitatively God is undefinable you cannot describe God because by definition when you describe something as soon as you apply an adjective to something you are saying this describes the nature of this entity which is limiting it even if we use the greatest adjectives that we have they're still describing describing by definition is defining and if God is undefinable we cannot address God with any adjectives by definition. So, how do we get from this undefinable entity which is infinite both quantitatively and qualitatively, sorry about that, that's just how words to pronounce properly, and this very limited, defined, tangible world that we know, and the answer is that there's an entire process of evolutionary process of downward spiritual evolution, of layers of reality, layers of awareness. And through this process, the realities become subsequently less and less in touch with the full truth, less and less aware of where they come from and how they came to exist. And it's a, a spiritual downward evolution. And as the layers of reality get subsequently less and less in touch with the full picture, the full truth of where they come from, how they come to exist. After that long process of evolution, they get, we end up with this reality here. Now, this Torah, which is this body of divine wisdom, is basically the highest, most spiritually advanced and ethereal entity to an extent outside of the creator itself. So there's the creator, which is not knowledge or wisdom divinity. Then there is divine knowledge, divine wisdom, the creator's awareness, the creator's knowledge information, which is pretty much at the very top of this evolutionary chain down towards the world that we know. So Torah really is the highest source of divinity, of godliness outside of the creator itself. Now, we cannot grasp the Creator. The Creator is not tangible. It's not an object. It's not an idea. You can't hold them with your hands. You can't hold them with your mind. Information is tangible. We can grasp information with our minds. So, Torah, divine wisdom, has been expressed in the form of information that we can process, understand, and store in our minds as a means of accessing divinity. This divine body is the highest source of divinity outside of the creator itself and everything that exists throughout the spectrum of this evolutionary chain descends from this body of divine wisdom aka Torah. So Torah is the ultimate highest source of everything. So now generally speaking Torah study is a good way the best way to an extent and that's another whole discussion, but to connect to the Creator. The best way that we have to form the deepest, most internal connection with the Creator that's possible is through Torah. It is unparalleled. It can. There's no way to store divinity inside the neurons in your brain other than Torah study, which Torah is divinity stored inside of information which can be physically stored in our neurons. Torah is the earliest form of existence outside of the Creator itself. And the Torah is divided up into Torah portions. And the allocation of a portion of the Torah to each week is not just arbitrary. It's very specific. And the specific, which we referred to as energy, the specific 
divinity that is inside of the body of information of each Torah portion is specifically relevant to each week. Now, any word in any part of Torah, written oral commentaries that we study at any time is divinity in the form of information and it connects us to the Creator. But in terms of the messages, the energy, the relevance, specifically to a given point in time, the energy, the divinity inside of Torah within a given Torah portion is specifically and primarily relevant to the time, the week in which that portion is read and studied even more than it is to the rest of the year. And this is why there's such an emphasis on Torah study because studying Torah we connect with the highest form of divinity that exists and specifically the part of it that's specifically relevant to this, these seven days of time. And now we understand why studying the Torah portion is called living with the time. When we study the Torah portion, we are connecting with the part of divine wisdom that's primarily relevant to these seven days of time. It's living with the time. Living with the source of this time. Time is a creation. We can't imagine a state of existence without time because we are designed to exist inside of the framework of time. But time is also a creation. God created time. Even time comes from the Torah, is created as a descendant, let's say, a progeny of the Torah, as is everything else that exists in and space. So living with the times, what the Alter Rebbe was referring to, is studying the weekly Torah portion and connecting with the specific, most specifically relevant portion of this body of Torah knowledge that is relevant to these seven days of time. I hope that brought some added meaning to the identity, the value, the meaning of Torah and Torah study and the Torah portion to everyone. And I'm looking forward to getting into the specifics, the details of this week's Torah portion a little bit more tomorrow. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.